I want to tell the story of the origin of species and how it came to be written. Earlier, we talked about this starting from a baseline in the West of the ideas of Aristotle, like these essentialist arguments that every living thing has some essential nature to it that makes it unchanging, that makes it immutable, it started to fall away during the age of reason as new information came into play. Early taxonomists found that the relationships you recovered from looking at homologies ended up in more of a branching tree-like kind of set of relationships rather than the ladder-like ones that would have been predicted by the scalinotary. Early microscopists found that all living things had some kind of underlying structural unity to them in the cell. Similarly, a lot of of new information came to the fore about the age of the earth through geology, as well as evidence for past life being different than it was today through the work of early paleontologists. So now we have a whole lot of new facts that are begging for some kind of explanation. One of the earlier explanations for how evolution could take place by a French biologist named Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck. Now, Lamarck had two main aspects to his theory about how things would have changed over time. The first is called the law of use and disuse. Now, this is what I have here are pictures of two animals, obviously a giraffe you probably recognize, as well the shorter necked one is called an okapi. It's a, it's a relative of the giraffe. Now, Lamarck's idea is that an animal like a giraffe would have gotten a long neck due to like the effort of kind of stretching its neck to get up to higher leaves. So over the course of its lifetime, it could change its outward appearance, could change its phenotype so that it would be able to do that better. Okay, now this makes a certain amount of sense because you know if you go to the gym and work out that the muscles that you work out get larger. So by analogy, Lamarck worked with the same kind of idea that effort you expend during your lifetime can cause changes to your body. So that's the effects of use and disuse. Oh, the disuse part of it would be if you in turn stop using those um, the particular parts of your body for particular functions, then they're going to atrophy back to whatever their ancestral like beginning condition was. The other one of his big ideas was called the heritability of acquired characteristics. So these characteristics that you acquired during your lifetime through like effort would be able to get passed down to your children and to their children. So this is an explanation, okay? It's an hypothesis that tries to explain facts like all hypotheses do. But I mean, to start with the first question is like, is this what causes giraffes to get their long necks? Um, actually not. See, this is what giraffes actually use their long necks for, for fighting. So anyway, the thing that I want you to get about Lamarck is that his idea for how life changed over time was this. Um, in this graph, what you're seeing is the x-axis is showing time, so older to the left and it gets more recent to the right. And then the sort of y-axis of scale of organization, basically think of it as like more complicated. So the very lightest dots in this diagram probably represent like unicellular or like small microscopic multicellular critters that over time, the earliest living things were able to become more and more complicated through like the efforts of their change. And things that spontaneously arose later in, in history, in earth history, would have basically not as much time to catch up. So the great chain of being, as we would see it at the end, kind of braced off here, that's the result of different species kind of coming into existence at different times and each of them having a different amount of time to um, be able to develop. Now, there are problems with this too. I mean, first of all, the giraffe argument is a bad one because that's not what they use their necks for. I mean, yeah, they do eat off high leaves, but that's not what it's for. The other thing is there's something that you know that also are going to falsify this, this hypothesis. You know, the idea that changes that happen to your body over your lifespan are inheritable is something that's like demonstrably false. You know, I don't have an appendix because mine ruptured about 12 years ago. Um, it doesn't mean that but my kids were both, or were both born with appendixes. So like there are some things that we know if you, if you're in an industrial accident that causes you to lose a hand or an eye, that doesn't mean your children are going to be inheriting those um, characteristics. 
So there are things that kind of falsify this theory. I mean, it's an explanation. So that's what we, so we still call it an hypothesis, but um, it's one that has traits about it that allow us to be able to falsify it. So the way the scientists would tend to operate is we start with the hypothesis that stands until we find a better explanation. Or if we find if we find facts on the ground that patently go against what would be predicted by these by this theory. Now, again, there were other ways to tell the story, but I'm just going to start off to talk about Darwin and how he came to have the facts exposed to him about the about the mutability of species. Old man Darwin that you can kind of see on the left there is the way we always see him kind of convalescing at home late in life. But um, that middle picture, well, he doesn't look that young, but he's about 25 when that um, when that portrait was done. Darwin was born um, relatively, you know, he was comfortable. He was, wasn't super wealthy. He wasn't um, part of the aristocracy, but he was, he kind of was born into the uh, Wedgwood China family. So he um, was certainly comfortable growing up and his father... You know, what he liked when he was a schoolboy, when he was a young adult, was he just liked experimentizing, he would say. You know, he was interested in chasing butterflies and collecting beetles and just kind of being out in the natural world, looking at rocks and just sort of um, doing these kind of outdoorsy things. But these outdoorsy things don't turn into a career. Now, his father wanted him to be have be some somehow gainfully employed, not because he needed the money, but just because he wanted to make sure that he was actually doing something with his life. So he sent him off to um, after high school, sent him off to medical school at Edinburgh, and he hated it. He thought that the dissections were grisly and horrifying. Of course, back then there weren't really good preservatives for cadavers, and you know he didn't really want to do that. So eventually, he convinced his father to let him go to Cambridge, where he studied theology. Not that he was going to become a theologian, but that he would be like trained, trained to be like a country parson. So he could um, preach to his flock on Sundays and then the rest of the week have it to be able to do like natural history stuff like collecting beetles. When he was at Cambridge, he met a number of mentors who became influential for the what the course of the rest of his life would take particularly um, Hooker, um, who was a botanist, as well as Lyle, Charles Lyle, again, the guy who wrote um, Principles of Geology. This was closer to the beginning of his career. And what they arranged after um, Charles graduated from Cambridge was for him to be like an unofficial naturalist, was the title, on the HMS Beagle, which is a map, which is going to be a mapping expedition that was going to go around the world. Now, Darwin's place there, it was in kind of an unofficial capacity because he wasn't really a member of the crew, um, but he was there to kind of basically be somebody who the, the captain would be able to have a conversation with. You know, officers and men didn't really, um, didn't really hang out um, at, this, at this like stage in the Royal Navy. And um, on a small ship like the Beagle, there would have been a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of kind of empty meal, you know, quiet meals if the um, captain didn't have somebody else who was educated and not a part of the crew to talk with. So anyway, Darwin was miserable on the voyage of the Beagle. He was seasick for any time they're out in open water. Um, it's likely in South America he contracted some kind of disease that dogged him for the rest of his life. But he took any opportunity he could to be able to go ashore to make collections, which was that was part of his job too, to make natural history collections. We tend to associate him most closely with the collections that were made on the Galapagos Islands, which is an, a volcanic archipelago of small islands to the, um, you know, to the west of uh, Ecuador. And, uh, and, all, and a number of animals that are found that seem to be endemic, meaning they're only found there, that, are, that, were, that became, that really started Darwin's mind to get thinking in different directions. You know, some things like the finches that are shown here. Um, today we call them Darwin's finches. At the time, when you look at them, they all have different feather colors. They also have all different kinds of beaks, like as far as their sizes, and they have different diets too. So they're specialized to do different things. Darwin figured when they were first collected that they were basically unrelated, relatively unrelated species. But when ornithologists studied them once he brought them back to England, they found that they're actually all pretty closely related and they all turned out to be different kinds of finches. Um, this, as an aside, has become one of the classic study organisms in evolutionary biology, Darwin's finches. Um, I'm not going to talk about it right now, but there's a lot of really interesting long-term work that's been done with them. In addition to the finches, 
There were a number of species not found anywhere else on the Galapagos, like the marine iguana shown here, the only kind of herbivorous iguana. What it does, it is actually, it swims underwater and, um, and like munches on algae, collected a bunch of fish. Those are like pressed plants up at the top that he collected. Of course, beetles, can't escape beetles. And like those fire crabs that are found there with a really distinctive coloration, but not known anywhere else. So Darwin wondered how it is you could get such a wide diversity of living things that seem to have a pretty close relationships with one another who are on the islands, but still be very different from one another from island to island. When he was on the mainland of South America, he also collected tons of fossils. In fact, Darwin was at his heart a geologist in the beginning because of what his training had been like, um, both as a child as well as his early research with um, Lyle. And so he collected fossils that were new to science. There's this uh, giant ground sloth shown up at the top and on the, on the right and on the bottom, those, those were animals called glyptodonts, which are relatives of um, armadillos. So they have like those big shells to them. In case you're wondering why it's a baseball player, it's because of the club tail. When Darwin first got to South America, he actually found, discovered those shells and found found the natives were living in them. After the voyage of the Beagle, Darwin went home to England and he never left again. Uh, I think that that trip was enough for him. He basically um, went back to his uh, family's estate at uh, Down and basically set about his experiments there. Like he had work to do. He had, he was like the editor for a multi-volume um, zoology of the beagle that was discovered. So basically he was the one who kind of coordinated the research and publication about the fossils and about the birds and about the mammals that, and other things that he had collected, that he collected on the trip. At home, he had a, you know, I mean, big garden, he had a big greenhouse, uh, his, and also like experiments kind of going on all the time. You know, he was curious about how coconuts were able to get from island to island. So what he did was he had some coconuts and he would basically let them float in a bathtub of salt water to be able to see how long they'd stay afloat. And you figure, okay, well, if it can stay afloat for 20 days, you know, keeping particular currents in mind, what does that mean about how far they can transport? He's, uh, he took visitors here at Down, had an active correspondence. But one of the things that was important to him as a, as a scientist was he wanted to be like a member of these kind of learned societies of people who were interested in science. Because back in the day, science was a relatively new term at this point. It was only coined in, about, in the 1830s. But there were these you know, kind of gentleman societies where people got together to be able to talk about whatever the little dabbling research they'd been, they'd been up to lately. One part of the research that Darwin did when he was at home was he read a treatise by a preacher called Malthus. Now, Malthus wrote this tract as basically it was supposed to be an argument against social programs for the poor, basically saying poor people have too many kids and that's why they're all starving. That's a crass way to put it, but that's kind of the take home message here. Um, What it relates to is how fast population grows. So this is a graph showing the last 12,000 years of human population growth. So it took us like 10,000 years, almost 12,000 years to get to, um, to, to get to that first billion people. But then we've just spiked up since then. What the ultimate size of human population is going to be is uncertain. On the left, you see there are like different projections where it could be, this could be about where we, where we um, top off if we're at a low level, but a high projection could see twice as many people on the planet as are around today. But of course, the population isn't going to be distributed equally all over the world. And on the right, this is showing basically that there are different growth rates for different countries. So there are a lot of things we don't understand. Um, and, but certainly when we look at growth of population in humans, we're not going to see an even distribution of resources everywhere, which is kind of the main thing that Malthus wrote about, which is to say that we know that if you, over time, resources will be able to increase. People become more efficient, farmers get better at their job, or even if you have like more children, more people being around means that you have like more hands to work the land so you can be more productive. But we'd say that resources grow in a linear fashion over time. On the other hand, population growth grows in an exponential way, meaning that it's going to grow a lot faster. So that point where the red line and the black line cross, I call that like the Malthusian crunch point, that's when there's no longer equal access to resources. 
after those lines cross, when you have more people than you have resources, then there will be competition for those resources. And not everybody is going to have equal access to them. And that's going to have effects on health, have effects on lifespan, have effects on reproductive ability. So this went into Darwin's head too. He'd seen these different kinds of animals and he understood about the kind of time period involved because of the new ideas about the age of the earth. And he also has in his head something about competition. Then he thought he could apply this to um, wild animals in addition to the way we thought about it for people. So Darwin spent a long time thinking on these ideas and not really moving on them. His working, and this is his, what was called his sand walk. It's like a third of a mile. He would walk every day just to have some time outside to sort of be left alone and think about stuff. Um, it actually reminds me of being home during the pandemic now where like you have your kids around and then, at least for me, you have your kids around and people are doing their things, but um, you need a little bit of time to kind of be on your own or sort of think about stuff. This is what Darwin's life was like. He, wa he certainly went to London to be able to interact with... Um, the other members of the Linnaean Society, the scientific society they participated with. But he was very methodical in his ideas about what he called the species problem, how it is that new species came about. Around the 1840s, there, there are a lot of different publications that had come out about ideas for the transmutation of species. One that um, was really had a, was a really popular success, but not the greatest science, was this book uh, by Robert Chambers called Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, which had a lot of pictures, uh, which made it interesting, a lot of fossils, a lot of fossil reconstructions, which is always a bookseller, um, but not a lot of particularly careful thinking. So the idea in the public was that transmutation of species you know, evolution over time didn't really come across like a serious endeavor. Um, so that was something that Darwin was kind of like working uphill against. Around this time in 1844, Darwin had been thinking on the species problem for some time and had already kind of formulated what his ideas about natural selection were. But one of the things that's important in science is to like establish priority. If you don't get your ideas published, then somebody else does them before you, then they get basically it becomes their idea, even if you had it independently. And so priority is like, it's like the coin of the realm for scientists. So basically Lyle and Hooker told Darwin, um, you can't talk about where species come from if you've never described a species before. So he like literally scraped the bottom of the barrel. The last sets of critters that were collected on the Beagle voyage that hadn't been described by somebody else were these barnacles. So he spent you know, the better part of a decade in doing careful work of like microscopic work of what the barnacles looked like and what their habits were. And, um, you know, in, in going really kind of doing a careful anatomical study of them so that he could have a good, what we call systematic, meaning like relationship knowledge of what these guys are about. And then uh, things kind of blew up on Darwin when a letter came his way. Darwin had was pretty well published at that point, doing lots of kinds of dabbling on natural history stuff, but it never really um, published his big species idea. So he got this letter from a biogeographer um, named Alfred Russell Wallace. Wallace didn't come from means like Darwin did. He was, um, he was somebody who had to work for a living, and he basically got his money working as a naturalist, and he had also gone on a global circumnavigation voyage. He had also collected animals from all over the world. He'd also thought about what's going to cause their differences in appearance, and um, he came up with an idea that was horrifyingly similar to what Darwin had already been thinking about. So Darwin opens this letter, and, um, and from Wallace saying, well, I know you know Hooker and Lyle. I think you could show them this idea that I had. And, you know, the honorable man that he was, he showed it to them and basically they said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to arrange for you and Wallace to be able to articulate your ideas about this thing we're going to call natural selection um, together. But you need to, if you're going to establish priority, you need to publish this book first, even if it's not what you had in mind. You know, so there was what Darwin called his priority essay from like 1844, where he'd already kind of laid out the basics of the idea, but he was dithering about trying to get it all backed up as well as he could. Wallace wasn't as careful a worker, which doesn't mean he wasn't a good scientist, but it means that he hadn't really rounded the bases the way that Darwin had. 
So basically, he got the opportunity for the, the pair of them pr to present at the same time at the Linnaean Society. And then after that, um, he was sent home and basically told to publish his book as quickly as he could. And finally, The Origin came out in 1859. And it was a... Um, it was certainly a success. Um, I mean, and it was also not just a success scientifically, but it was like a, a publication success as well. I mean, it sold in railway stations. It was really widely read, and it was meant to be something that was going to be understandable by lay people. Now, when we read it today, it's you're, you're going to see when we read parts of the origin. Um, it can be a little bit stilted in its reading, but um, it was the kind of thing that, that that was what people wrote like back in the old days. So a brief overview of what's in the origin of species. I'm going to dig in on the first few chapters and then just give you a flavor for the rest of them. Now, even though Darwin went on this global circumnavigation voyage, he doesn't start with the exotic. He doesn't start with the Galapagos. He starts with the farm because those are things that are familiar with people. The birds that you see there, those are called fancy pigeons. Fancy pigeons are basically produced by breeders who take like your basic sky rat that I have a picture of there too, and selectively breed certain individuals to get the traits that they want. Similarly, all the different kinds of dogs are all ultimately related to gray wolves. So all the domesticated dogs are all one species, and some of those can actually hybridize back with gray wolves, but not all of them can. So what Darwin says, okay, you know how living things are variable. Like within a single species, we can produce um, individuals that look really different from one another because we choose particular individuals that we're going to have interbreed. This kind of selection where like a farmer or a breeder chooses the individuals that are going to breed, he called this artificial selection. Okay, so the take home here is that living things within a species are variable and you can get particular traits that you want through selective breeding. Well, the last picture was dogs, this one will be cats. Then Darwin says, when you look at wild animals, not within a single species, but when you look within genera or families, higher taxonomic levels, you see that there's also a fair amount of variation. I mean, there are, uh, all these things are cats, clearly from the look of them. And we get that because of like the shape of their head, but they all have, they get different ears. They have different body proportions. Some of them have saber teeth. Saber tooth and actually evolved a bunch of times as it turns out. So basically what Darren says is that amount of variation that we see within living things, we see a similar range of variation when we look at, at wild animals as well. I made this penguins because when I look at these, I see a lot of animals that look really similar to one another. Animals that look really similar, we can assume are going to have very similar requirements for survival. So this is where Darwin kind of unveils the argument from that he got from Malthus, which is living things are going to be able to breed a lot faster than the environment will be able to support them. So not everybody who's born is going to be able to live to adulthood. Not everyone who lives to adulthood is going to be able to breed. So um, he kind of, in this chapter, he really talks about like the economic lives of animals and how that's going to affect um, reproductive success. So then finally, he drops the knowledge bomb in this chapter about natural selection. And there are going to be actual words for notes uh, coming on the next slide, but I want to kind of give the gist of it first, which is that living things are variable, but what decides who's going to survive depends on what's happening in the environment. So those like blonde colored mice, the lighter colored mice, they're cryptic when they're on, on dark rocks, but you can see uh, they're cryptic when, when they're on light rocks, but you can see them on the dark rocks. Similarly, the black ones, you can see that you can't see them on the basalt, but they're very clearly seen on the lighter rocks. When they're hunted by predators out in this desert environment, the ones that are kind of intermediate in color are going to be at a disadvantage, you know? So it's more important to be like all the way blonde or all the way dark um, because the in-betweeners are going to get picked off no matter what kind of gra what kind of, uh, uh, kind of sand they're on. So this is the main overview of how natural selection works. First of all, we observe that individuals within a population are variable. And we know that at least some of that variation is inheritable because of what we see through um, directed um, breeding. Malthus tells us that there are limited resources in, every, in, in any environment, so not every individual who's born is going to be able to survive. So we say offspring have differential survival as well as reproductive success. Now, it's not merely survival, but reproductive success we're going to see is the main criterion here. 
So what Darwin proposed from these four facts is that the survival and reproduction of individuals isn't random. Instead, it's tied to the variation among individuals, meaning the environment chooses which individuals fit best in their environment. So um, individuals are born and there's some variation within a population. Nature is going to choose which of those variants are the ones that are going to be successful because of, you know, the vagaries of the environment that they're in. Now, but nature doesn't like cause the variation. So basically, in contrast to what Lamarck would say, you get whatever you get when you're born and but you can't change it over your lifetime noticeably. So nature only selects what's all what the variation is like there. You know, so like the dice are rolled and then individuals are variable, but nature doesn't actually make that variation happen. Those individuals who can survive well, we say they fit in better, right? So those individuals that are fit leave more offspring in the next generation. So what we call fitness, don't hear that as like individual fit, a physical fitness. What we mean is how well fit they are to their environment. Fitness, then, we measure in terms of reproductive success. I'm often going to use fitness and reproductive success interchangeably because that's like that's what we're that's what we're talking about here. And over time, I say that the population has a higher proportion of like fit individuals because like history is written by the winners. So it's the ones who survive, whether due to good genes or good luck, um, the whichever ones are present in populations, you know, that survive to adulthood, they're the ones that are going to be able to um, have, leave behind more offspring. And then Darwin also assumed that change in most characteristics is very gradual. This is an idea um, that we're going to see has been modified pretty extensively um, after Darwin's work, but um, this is where he was on it. So this is like the main intellectual argument of, of the origin of species. I'm just going to really quickly run through what the rest of the book is about. Basically, this is showing what the, the, the primary contrast would be between what Lamarck said and what Darwin said. Lamarck's theory, I showed you this picture before, this is um, basically the idea that if you leave, an, the older an environment is, you get more diverse species because they have different amounts of time to kind of squeeze themselves into the environment. So you end up with the great chain of being. I put that piece of like sage grass up there because it's what I think of. Like if I don't mow my lawn for a while, I start getting like these really long, you know, really long stalks of stuff. It looks really different than like what regular grass looks like. Now, so Lamarck's idea is sort of the leave it alone and things get more complicated model. But Darwin saw not this ladder-like set of relationships like the Scalinaturi, but also saw more like what Linnaeus saw with this bushy-like um, set of relationships among living things. Darwin spends time talking about how living species are variable. Darwin was actually hopeless on genetics um, because that wasn't what he studied. The actually work by Mendel um, came about very late in his life, but there's no evidence that Darwin actually was aware of Mendel's work. Here I'm just comparing species of um, fish, uh, species of fish that are called cichlid fishes. They're found in these deep rift valley lakes in East Africa. And from looking at them, visually you see they're similar in appearance. But if you look at the names, and don't get me wrong, humans gave them those names, but they gave them those names because they're actually different species from one another. They can't interbreed with one another. The reason why they look so similar though is because these are animals that are found in similar places in these deep water lakes. Some of them are low down, some of them hang out along like rocky surfaces, some of them are out in open water. Um, so you get different colorations and body shapes depending on where they live, even though they're not related to one another. So they kind of converge on similar appearances. Darwin has kind of a chapter that sort of lays out, okay, here are some problems you've probably foreseen. In fact, this is the whole rhetorical style that he uses, where Darwin makes a statement, and then he says, yeah, yeah, I know what you're thinking. And he tries to come up with, um, you know, what are quibbles somebody might have with his ideas. So most of, he called the origin of species one long argument, where he does a sort of quasi-Socratic method of saying, well, how could this thing be true? And then sort of, and then goes and explains it. Darwin did more about than talk about just bodies, though. He also talked about instinct. So if there are some things that humans do, there are some things that animals do that where they don't have to be taught. They're born knowing how to do these things. So Darwin says these attributes that they're born, behaviors that they're born with must have some kind of 
you know, must have some kind of selectable basis. You know, there's something about it being built into the way the body works. So the example I have here is it was called a nest parasite called the cowbird. Um, where basically the cowbird is, we all know the birds like beg for food from their mother. So the mothers or, and fathers are um, instinctively, they, they will tend to feed the ones who squawk more. And what you're looking on the right there, the big bird, that's the cowbird. And the other ones are the nests of the sparrow that's actually supposed to be there. Those are the actual babies there. So what happens is the um, the mom cowbird lays an egg in the sparrow nest. And then the sparrow, the little baby cowbird comes out. He grows faster. He squawks more. So like mom and dad's sparrow think they've like hit the jackpot. And, you know, those cowbird, those little jerks even like will kick the other um, birds out of the nest in order to be able to get themselves more food. So they're like tricking this nest parasite tricks these parents by, by, by kind of um, laying the uh, preying on the um, instincts that they have for feeding their offspring. But as a result, and the cuckoos do this too, that's where the term cuckolding comes from, is you, um, you trick somebody else into taking care of your kids. He talks about hybrids too. Um, you've probably seen different examples of hybrids. So when you put together a lion and a, a male lion and a female tiger, you get yourself a liger. Pretty much my favorite animal. They... Um, and so they actually, and so the biggest of the big cats are these hybrids. Lots of hybrids display what they call hybrid vigor, which is they tend to be like bigger or stronger than what you would expect from like your ordinary sort of like purebred within a species offspring. But one thing that's actually cool about this, um, if you watch Game of Thrones, they're the well, one of the a bunch of the characters in them are these dire wolves. Now, dire wolves were an actual ice age animal, but if you look at the bottom there, they're like. A little bit bigger maybe like 25 percent bigger than um gray wolves are but they're not as huge as what you see in the in the show so actually those animals are actually hybrids so those are hybrid wolves that um more approximate the size of this other species called epicyon so even these really big like really like large mammals the ones that we see even in popular entertainment are actually hybrids not purebred animals Darwin spends a lot of time complaining about the fossil record. Even though he's a geologist, he saw the fossil record as this, like, not so much a library as like a museum where you sort of periodically make collections. Darwin was writing at the very beginning of the systematic study of paleontology. And there actually were some predictions that he made that ended up being correct about um about predicted relationships or predicted ancestors for different groups but um he spends yeah like i said he spends a long time complaining about the fossil record but it's just because it had only barely begun to have been explored at the time that he was writing the origin the reason why the fossil record is so sketchy is because of a process called taphonomy which is um how um those are the processes that happen to a living thing after it dies if they can turn to a fossil it's got to get buried in an anoxic environment and like not disturbed for a certain period of time so that it can get mineralized. And so it's, um, these are very rare events. So as a result, you don't find fossils everywhere. You don't find land fossils as frequently as you find, um, marine fossils, um, just due to the, just due to the vagaries of fossilization. So that's the biggest part of his complaint. But what he does say is he makes some comparisons here in this uh, chapter about the geologic succession of organic beings that, you know, you find like mostly marine, mostly shelly animals deep down in the fo in the fossil record. But then as you become as you get closer to the recent, you start seeing like the big reptiles like dinosaurs and then you start seeing mammals. So there is a certain directionality of the fossil record that he does that even he admits exists. So the thing to understand is that the fossil record, though it was only beginning to be understood, even at that point, it was clear that there seemed to be some kind of directionality and that animals don't just sort of appear randomly throughout the record. So one prediction that he made is if we look, I mean, if you look in that, this uh, strat column here and you can see like where the Cambrian, the Ordovician was, you know, if you found like a bunny rabbit in the Cambrian, that would show that there's like no real like rhyme or reason to the order of evolution. So I think that we can make predictions that living things shouldn't be popping into existence randomly, that there does seem to be some kind of succession as you go up through the fossil record. 
We're going to talk more about geology and time in the next lecture. Getting to the end here, um, he also talks about geographic distribution. Um, on the right here, this is showing um, like the current day uh, distribution of one kind of squirrel. Um, you can see like how pandas used to be more widespread than they are today. You know, so basically, Darwin talks about where you find living things like on a, on a continental scale, but also how living things tend to be, you know, restricted to certain biogeographic areas. So the evolutionary history of animals and plants and other living things in these individual biogeographic zones tend to be their own story. And interestingly, that Wallace's line that you can see on the inset map, that's the boundary between the, um, the Oceanan and the um, Oriental biogeographic zones. There are even right there between Bali and Lombok, there are actually no species in common between those two islands. There are islands that you can almost see one from the other, but there's something that prevents animals from getting, you know, kind of making a little jump there. So there are little, some places where there are like real hard barriers. Um, not just big deserts, but something, you know, even just ocean currents can separate out these biogeographic zones. Anyway, he also talks some about um, morphology, embryology. This is also something that was becoming big at the time when he was writing, um, but I'll, we'll unpack a little bit more of this later. Just to tie things up, this is like the one picture that's in The Origin of Species. Darwin took the information that he'd gotten from like 20 years before on his Beagle voyage, combined them with readings for thinking about the economic lives of animals and was able to put together a coherent hypothesis for how life could have changed over time, what he called his theory of transmutation. Now, natural selection is like the main thing that we would take from this book, but he did like other work like to come later. But one of the things that's important about the origin, and it's not that Darwin was a prophet, it's not that he was writing about everything, but what he did was he recognized the majority of like the big aspects of the history of life that have to be explained if we're going to understand how it had changed over time. What we'll be doing over the next few lectures is doing some other things to develop our sp perspective about the history of the earth, as well as to talk about um, biological molecules that are like the grist for the mill for evolution to happen.